I don't have the wit for irony, you know? But here's the other thing. Irony is also hiding. Irony is not saying this is how I really feel. It felt like there was a veil in front of me all my life. And suddenly that veil had been sort of pulled apart and I could really experience things. I could really feel and suddenly I was alive with being alive. Hi, I'm Lizzie Goodman and welcome to Difficult Artist, a podcast about the creative process. Ed O'Brien has, to borrow his words, won the golden ticket when it comes to his creative life. As a high school student in Oxford in the mid-80s, he and his friends formed what would become Radiohead. Now, I remember standing outside the Mercury Lounge in New York in the early 2000s, talking with this woman who was a booker at the venue at the time. And she was saying how good the Strokes were and how good so many of the bands we were seeing in that era were, but also that they would never get big because people just didn't care about rock bands anymore. To me, she seemed super wise because she was like 25 and I was maybe 21. So she'd seen a lot of the world from my perspective. But I remember solemnly kind of nodding as she said all of this and then just asking her, like, are there any great rock bands left? Radiohead, she said kind of wistfully. They are the best band in the world. The thing about getting to be in the best band in the world is that it can be kind of a golden handcuff situation. You're part of this magnificent organism, but you never stand on your own. And there's pluses and minuses to that, which we get into in the episode. But we also talk about how at the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic hit, Ed was just beginning to tour in support of his solo debut, an album that has been gestating for the better part of eight years. Earth, as it's called, is a warm, big, churning ode to life of a record with all of its varieties of moods and emotions and feelings. This is an album that consciously and deliberately leads from the heart, which, as Ed explains in the episode, is not easy for an Englishman. We talked about that, plus what it feels like to claim your space at the front of the stage just as the world is shutting down. We talked about the dip back into depression that Ed experienced during lockdown, and about how in the beginning, most rock bands are formed for the same reason, because you just want to look cool and get laid. I want to start by asking you about your space. Where do you, where do, what, when you go to work right now, where do you go? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What time do you go there? What's your routine like these days? Well, I've just, I've just built uh, my dream space or, or, or created it rather. Um, it's the first time I've had this and it's, it's in Wales. It's in our house in Wales and it's on the ground floor. And the house is a Georgian house, big high ceilings, and it's sort of, it's got three, three, large, uh, three large windows that open fully mm-hmm. from the mm-hmm. you know, classic Georgian. And it's got a fireplace, which is very important for me. Any, so, you know, eight years ago, I was in the shed in the garden in London. That was my space. But it had a wood-burning stove, which for me is absolutely key for winter and there's something about having been you know spent my most of my childhood in the countryside you right you you heat a house from from your open fire so yeah. there's something it helps me get through winter there's something about the flame there's something about so my ideal mm. workspace always has um has a wood burning stove or a fire in it and then it's just a really beautiful room and i've got my i've got my musical equipment you know, mm-hmm. I've got and I, I've I've created this space. Um, I haven't worked much in it because uh, I've been exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had the guilt of like it got it got finished in about January of this year, and it's just a room, and we filled it out, and it's got my shelves and all my pedals and guitars and all all my bits, and it's got a lovely desk that, and um, yeah, for whatever reason. Well, I know a lot of reasons, but I just, I, it's been the weirdest, the weirdest thing during this second lockdown is mm. going into that space and going, oh, I'm just so exhausted. There's nothing here. <laughs> yes. And, and then you get the guilt. You go like, oh my God, have I just I created this, this heaven and, and this, this incredible workspace and then I'm not going to use it. So mm. thankfully. You will. I know and I yeah. will. And it, it, I have this the, the, I have this shuffle between London and Wales because the family, kids are at school here. 
But right. Wales is where, mid Wales is where I really feel an energy. You know, mm -hmm. I feel it's a very, I, I, I find this, and I don't know if you found this, but there are parts of the world that I really, I find are creatively fertile. Mm -hmm. The Southwest, where you're from, for instance, yes. New Mexico, yeah. I feel really alive yeah. down there in, in that part, Arizona. I just, I love it. And the same thing in mid Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, 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 the, it's a remote part of the UK, which is quite hard to find. Totally. And interesting yeah. enough, as a little kind of um, digression, it was where Robert Plant has, uh, has a house on the other side of the mountain. And I think he's had it since 1969. He's, on, he's in this place called Artist Valley. And he's written a lot, a lot, of, a lot of Jimmy Page and Robert Plants. They wrote a lot of, I think, Led Zeppelin three and four were written wow. there. And it's so interesting because when you go to this land and you're in it, you suddenly go, of course, it's almost like that music, <laughs> particularly, particularly the arpeggio, the guitar kind of acoustic and the kind of, you know, where the laments and the sing it, it's almost like <laughs> yes. the music comes from this land this soil you yes. can feel it it's it's totally. i can feel it anyway maybe but um so yeah that's where but I, it's that's, where it speaks to you i mean maybe yeah, it doesn't hugely. you know it might not be for everyone but it's sort of that sign you get from the geography of a place that this is this is a spot you should s s dig deeper in or kind of like breathe into and see what comes out um yeah and yeah. i think it's i think it's i think the places that I resonate with are very old places. It's like, yes. you know, the Southwest, it's very old, very. right? Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. feel it in the land and you can walk it and you can, you know, there's something in it. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm sensitive to this stuff. And I, so the thing about mid Wales is it feels very old and it feels like sort of eternity. It feels like it's always been here and you can feel the echoes of people that, when I always feel like walking down tracks that if you get in the right, right, you know, not always, cause sometimes, but s sometimes you walk down these tracks and, and you can mm -hmm. feel the echoes of the people who walked them before. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I feel, you know, I resonate with that. And the woods and the spaces yeah. that this sort of, as we've talked about many times, the power of the sort of natural world as a, humbling and in a source of a source of humility and a source of inspiration at the same time and the power of that yeah um do you so i mean this is like such an idyllic now fantasy i'm painting for your creative life in wales of you sort of strolling and like a good coat around some <laughs> some <laughs> some beautiful paths and like feeling the led zeppelin vibe and the history of all this sort of c curious magic art realm how does that become a song like how does that what do you take home from that and what is it that that makes you I don't know like pick up the guitar I don't know if you start on guitar or just mm. talk me through a little bit the sort of granularity of how you atomize that inspiration into something how you how do you synthesize it into something that we then get to hear because I know everything you're saying is so much a part of what has gone into your your right. record and but also probably before that too this sort of connection between walking through the the earth in that way and then making something out of it like how does that actually work it's well I, i'm you know i still feel i'm very much a novice i've only done this i've only been songwriting like this for you know the past eight years so i'm still trying to figure it out but i guess if i tell you the how I did it on the last record, it might give you an idea, it might inform you how. Please. Um, so I went to Mid Wales, we didn't have the house then, I was staying on a farm and I had two weeks on my own and I'm staying on this farm and I'd, I'd, I'd get up pretty early, uh, well, seven o'clock and I'd walk, mm -hmm. I'd walk to the top of the mountain and I would then walk back down and usually the mountain was, was covered, was shrouded in mist. So you know it's 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 quite a quite a new sensation for you know it's not something i grew up with so <laughs> you know and then you walk down into the valley and the river y goes on the valley and i walked along walked along the river and there are all these old gnarly oaks so right. you feel in nature's there's no one there's not a soul around nature's in abundance 
and I pulled out my copy of Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman, uh -huh. and I start reading it. But I don't just start reading it to myself. I read it aloud. Okay. Wow. You know, kind of Dead Poet Society-esque. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I get inspired by, when, when a writer, when a, it's, it's a bit like bottling light or a bit like bottling spirit. When a writer is able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and those words convey that feeling and you just feel alive. Mm -hmm. And so I'd read these words and I'd read them out aloud almost to, to the trees, <laughs> to the, yeah. you know. And if anyone had seen me, they would have think I'm an absolute madman. <laughs> but fuck it because it works yeah. and it's powerful and it makes so i would come back from the river and i'd be so totally alive and yeah. and the thing about reading something like whitman was for me anyway and i'm not a whitman scholar i'm just somebody who reacts to his words was that i felt this kind of huge kind of love is 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 strong but for the magnificence of life in all its totality which yes. is you know warts and all which is the dark and the light mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. you know there are many times like we all do we're all in the darkness and we feel that but i really cherish those times when you like you can pull back and you go oh my god you know, this is extraordinary. It's the cosmic, I guess it's almost like a cosmic perspective. It's like mm -hmm. we're on this little rock orbiting a sun, yeah. you know, in the middle of space on the edge of our Milky Way. And all this stuff goes on and people like um, uh, Carl Sagan, Pale Blue yes. Dot, puts it beautifully. Big inspiration for your Huge. record Earth. Yeah, yeah. So I go back and then I'm, I'm alive. And I, I'm yeah. really, really alive. I'm like, all my senses are alive. And yeah. I then just pick up a guitar and, and then I, it's sort of like a meditative mm. process. I don't know what happens at that time when you start and when you finish. And what I learned, the big thing I learned, which I learned for the first time eight years ago, was not to edit myself at that point. Your mind is removed from it. It's not like always before I, I'd sabotage anything that would come out going, well, that's not as good as Paranoid Android. That's not as good as Street Spirit. That's not as good as everything in its right place. Well, what are you doing? And what I didn't understand was the process of, of just letting it be, let it come out. And then at a later stage, you know, maybe the next day or even a week later, that's when you get into the editing. You go, okay, that bit's good. And, and then, and then you, you, you take that bit and you, you then sort of get in the same state, if you like, Mm -hmm. and then work at it so i have to That's be inspired it's a feeling yeah. for me it's a feeling it's a feeling um i'm trying to i'm trying to what, through the music what i'm trying to do it's it's a feeling it's an emotional thing and it's not mm -hmm. it's not a mental thing it's not you know i'm in huge admiration of of the poets who you know who 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 put music to to to, to poetry but that's mm -hmm. not where I'm coming from. The words come after the music and it's a bit like seeking them out there. I always think they're already written. And my yeah. job is to like, I start with sounds or whatever. And uh -huh. it's, to, it's, to, it's to try and a bit like archeology span working away at, a, <laughs> yes. at the, at the with theme. With a brush. Of, yes. at, exactly, of a huge brontosaurus or a little, you know, and you just like, oh, that's what it is. Sound first, words Sound right first, after. Place. But I've got my green notebook which is full <laughs> yes. of you know and that's uh -huh. something I, you know that I learned off Tom from going to art school you know one of the okay. things that they t teach you at art school is that you know you you keep a notebook so so anything that you know something came to me this morning and or anything that just again I'm not trying to overthink it it's about it's very right. it's, it's very intuitive yeah. it's kind of like mm -hmm. okay just write that down and and yeah just, it's right you don't even, yeah, and that idea, I'm really, like, don't, what you were saying before about just sort of having to teach yourself not to get in the way of it. I mean, it's like, in a way, when you've done all that, what you're describing is work. Like, in 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 a way, you're, I mean, of course, you're not trying, which is what you mm. just said. Like, it's about not trying, but you also are in that you've put yourself in this situation to be in the woods for two weeks with nothing to do but this. And you've gotten up at seven and gone on the walk. And it's sort of like a, 
an invitation to the universe to deliver. It's like, I'm, I'm at the office now, if you'd yeah. like to <laughs> offer is, me something. It, it's, it's so yeah. true. And, and I think what you realize is when you, you know, I'm obviously interested in other people's uh, the way yeah. they work. And you'll know this because you've interviewed, you, you know this more, but I think there's definitely something about having a time of the day, a regular rhythm, you know, where you check in and it's almost like it is, it's like an invitation for the universe to go, all right, you're ready. And I, I you know, I, I'm going to say it like, I, and I'm, I've read it a lot, but I think like music in a way, I feel like it's channeling. I really do. I mean, I like, I don't know how, how I do it. I don't, I think, I think it's just, I think my job as a musician and as a, 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 a as create is to, obviously there's a craft and there is a craft that's really important because you need to kind of be able to set this stuff up. But the initial, I, I feel like it's, it, it, it's about the, being the best conduit that you can for this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've bored people mm -hmm. senseless with probably you before <laughs> as well about, you know, how there's this whole concept of, you know, you get, you get into physics and this whole idea of past, present and future and on the cutting edge of physics, it's happening all at the same time. And on our planet and our universe, it's perhaps the only way we can deal with all this stuff is by placing it in a linear, you know, we've got, we've got a history, mm -hmm. we've got a future. And maybe it's all going on the same. And to me, that makes sense that it's going on all the time because it's, again, it taps into that thing of that's already written. And my mm -hmm. job is to, is to tune into that frequency of that kind mm -hmm. of, of that music. And there are lots of different types of music, but I've read that on so many, you know, mm -hmm. when you hear Aretha Franklin saying, I'm just a channel for God's music, you mm -hmm. know, I'm like, yeah. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> you are. I, I, yes. I'm a white, I'm a white middle class guy who maybe doesn't have the religious, the gospel religious upbringing. So I'm kind of reticent to use the word God. But right. I do, if I'm totally honest, I don't know how I do it. And I know that yeah. when it doesn't happen, I, I feel like I'm not ready to be in that place. And when it does happen, mm -hmm. it's seamless. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all those things. To me, that's what makes sense of writer's block. All this stuff is... Totally. I really think that that it is like it, it's you know this as a writer that when you're in the flow, it's seamless, it's easy. I guess it would be like surfing, right? But there are other times, and it's important to work through those other times when it's a struggle, right? That's mm -hmm. I loved your totally. six stage your six stages of creativity. <laughs> <laughs> as, have you had that on the podcast yet? No, no. Can I say it? Um, Please. And when did we for, tell? Yeah. Ha, when did we? F I know we've been talking about this for ages, actually, but I don't remember. It must have been at Glastonbury at some point where I, I laid this on you. But go ahead. Yes. Explain. It was it was absolutely brilliant because I, I was, well, you know, you writing, you were finishing, you were finishing Meet Me in the Bathroom. And, you know, I'd embarked upon this new solo journey mm -hmm. and you sent me the six stages of creativity. <laughs> and so stage one. This is great. <laughs> Stage two, this is okay. Stage three, this is shit. <laughs> Stage four, which is my favorite stage, which is I am shit, which right. is the worst stage. <laughs> Stage five, this is okay. And stage six, this is great. And it yeah. is what, what you did, what brilliantly, and it was the same for every Radiohead album I've been involved in, this kind of yeah. arc, right? This journey, it's a creative, it's a creative journey. And it's so, that helped me so much in the I am shit phase, which is inevitable, which can go on quite a long time, right? It's, it's a pretty long one. It's, it's the majority of the faces in my experience. <laughs> I know, exactly. It's I mean, terrible. That's, that's kind of like, that's, that has been a bit of a default setting in my life too. <laughs> yes. And I, you know what? It's funny. I, as you're saying this, I'm remembering, like one of the things that I find most it's honestly why I wanted to make this podcast is literally that because like any other sort of extreme mental place like grief or or falling in love or having your heart broken, these sort of primal universal themes of human emotion, cycles of human emotion, the creative process is like that too. And you 
I mean, I do this, I'm doing this to myself right now because I'm in a, I'm supposed to, I'm working on another book, but it's not going that well. And it's like, I just, I just, it's like, it's like, it's, it's the first time all over again. You're just, you forget that there is a routine. There's sort of a predictable cycle to these things. And what's useful about hearing other people's experience, whether it's about heartbreak or grief or the creative process is it's like, Oh, right. Like this is normal. Actually. Mm. Like this is a very normal, the process on the other side of I am shit, whether it's tomorrow or months from now is, are these other phases like nothing. And this actually cycles without getting too, too woo woo, but cycles into what you were saying too, about the sort of like nonlinear nature of time. Like you are not, you're, you're not always going to be where you are right now, even though, but, and also part of the creative process is forgetting that is yeah. forget, you know, that is in a way like a hallmark of the fact that you're just making something again. And what's powerful is when you've done it before, there is, if you pay attention, a way to kind of like send little signals to yourself for the next time that it's it's never as hard as it is the first time all over again. There is a part of you that has a mild presence of mind enough while you're in the shit to be like, Oh yeah, I think uh-huh. this is gonna end at some point. And although you know, we'll we'll get into this, but I know it sounds like we're both in a phase where remembering that is feeling a little tricky. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. and it's it's yeah, but it's isn't that like it's funny? It's that's one of the things about life. It's just it, it, you 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 can keep. I don't know. I or you 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 go to familiar places, and when you're in it, you go like, Am I ever gonna be out of this place? Right. You know? And, right. and yeah, I think the thing is, like you said, the first time it's the hardest, it's a bit yeah. like having your heart broken. The first time your heart's broken it is crushing, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely crushing. It's still hard after that, but it's never as, and I think you, you rec- I think the thing is, is to recognize these feelings and not to give yourself a hard time. I mean, for right. me, and, and not to go like, oh, I really am shit. It's to go like, I'm feeling shit, but I'm not shit. <laughs> right yes which is but also that's still you know. hard because you're still I mean I, I'm still trying to work I mean I meditate I've been meditating for 20 years I'm still trying to figure this shit out right I mean right. And I think I think it's like it's I think it's like in life anyway it's like chipping away it's yeah. like you, you occasionally have big you know you ha- you can have big breakthroughs and you can have big sort of epiphanies or huge moments of massive growth but on the whole it's just like it's just mm-hmm. like chipping away at that at that sculpture going yeah okay all right i've got to go around the other side and do the butt because the butt needs some attention <laughs> the butt always needs some work you know it's <laughs> the like the toughest part <laughs> <laughs> okay i have a personal question for you what interferes with your happiness is something preventing you from achieving your goals these rhetorical questions are intimidating like so many things are preventing me from achieving my goals uh most of them are in my own head but that is where better help comes in better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist you connect in a safe and private online environment it is really convenient um you can start communicating in under 48 hours BetterHelp is not a crisis line it's not self-help it is professional counseling done securely online You can send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions if that's better for you. All without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room and like, you know, look at weird art on the walls and see other humans. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's always really awkward when you have to break up with a therapist. So this is like a much easier way to find someone who really works for you. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available, which is really cool. Actually, everyone should be able to have access to therapy. The service is available for clients worldwide. Uh, Another perk. So find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to the counselors located near you. Licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping issues, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem. It's like, check, check, 
check, check. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Um, anything you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, affordable. And you can check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash difficult artist. Join over a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash difficult artist. So talk me through, if you can, a bit of the evolution of that process. Like, obviously, you were drawn to music. You've talked a lot about being drawn to music the way a lot of us are in childhood as a sort of form of, of like of self soothing therapy for whatever your life has, has put, has circumstance have put you in. How did that become, let's start there. How did that change from, I want to listen to whatever it is like echo and the Bunnymen to I I'm putting echo and the Bunnymen in your, yeah. in your story for me at the moment, right. but feel free to fill that in. Um, to I want to make something myself because that's actually different, right? Like yeah. those are different instincts. Yeah, talk to me a bit about that. Well, I, th- I think it sort of ca- came around about age 14 or 15. And, you know, it goes from you suddenly, you suddenly sort of start, I think you hear music and then you're intrigued and it's like, well, how do they make that sound? And for mm-hmm. me, I was talking about this with Johnny Marr. I, was, I feel very lucky that I grew up in a time when, so for instance, you know, around the time of age, I guess, 12, when suddenly music stops being something you just listen to, but it's something you become obsessed with as well. And so Mm -hmm. there are a lot of bands like um, Susie and the Banshees at the time, Spellbound was a massive record. There was, I remember hearing, I mean, the record that made me, which I've always credited, made me kind of, want to was like intrigued about the sound was walking on the moon by the police Mm -hmm. and i heard that song and it said this is a perfect i mean it's a perfect pop song in a way but it sonically it sounded like they were walking on the moon and i was just (laughs) yes i was like how do they do that and of course (laughs) there was then a documentary on on the bbc about it's called around the world in 80 days which followed the police around that album regatta de blanc and i sort of you get you hone in and I, I got sort of obsessed by watching Andy Summers, the guitarist, and the way that he played and the sounds that he was getting. And I was just like, because I'd heard, you know, we're very lucky and grew up with Top of the Pops. So I was very versed in pop music, but I wasn't turned on by the sound, if you like. I wasn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't intrigued enough to, to go like, how do they do that? And also I was learning instruments, which were not, at the time, you know, I'd learned the the violin when I was a kid I learned I was learning the trumpets mm. um they were those weren't the sounds that I was hearing that I was really loving right and so it went from it suddenly went from I guess I went to a school you suddenly see I remember there was a boy in my year when I was 14 I went to Abingdon which was the school that the band all met at mm-hmm. and he came into a mu- he came into the music you know it was like a show and tell, if you like, for teenagers. And he, you know, everyone was playing their kind of piano a bit. It's all a bit boring. <laughs> and then he comes in with this box and this plugged and this electric guitar. And I was just completely transfixed. Oh. It was like a Les Paul copy. And I was just like, oh my God, how do I, how do I get? And it was like, how do I do that? And the thing is, as well around Abingdon, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of music shops. It wasn't like now where yeah. you can order Fender have got like, there was like, it was just like, it was like trying to find a, 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 a an obscure record. How do I, mm-hmm. how do I find that? It was all about how do I find that? How do I get that? <laughs> right. It's that true. A- it feels like dispatches from an alternate universe that someone yeah. has come back from and is now sitting in your classroom and you're like, I know yeah, an exotic, an exotic it re- sense. It yeah. was completely exotic. And then I saw, then the sort of, you know, then you sort of become aware of the school and there were people in various years. And I was aware of Tom because mm-hmm. he was on the same, he would be on the same school bus as 
as my my sister i weekly boarded so i'd only go on that bus once a week but my sister would come in every day and tom was on and he'd i'd go in on i'd often come in on a monday morning and there was this guy carrying this guitar and so it then sort of you know then you suddenly see people are playing stuff and the next year and you and 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 it just goes from there really it starts off as and it starts off as it i don't think it was it wasn't like i obviously didn't feel any connection you know with what i'm talking about now it's very different process yes it, it was more about making noise and trying to be cool and <laughs> Yes. You know, and and no, and I think that's uh, that's something just that's something that people tend to feel is like a derisive way to talk, like as if that's somehow not good enough as a yeah. reason to me. It's like when you're 16, I mean, somebody I can't remember who, but I'm someone said to me once, like, I wouldn't. Like if I didn't wasn't trying to get attention from girls, I wouldn't write shit like that's yeah. not, you know, there's <laughs> it's so true. It's okay for that, especially when you're 14 and 15 years old. Like that is the history of rock and roll. Like I don't, I think that's beautiful. I think there's so much yeah. beauty in that desire to make noise and have people look at you and think that those, these are primal forces of, you know, adolescent development that are, that are why, you know, Elvis exists and why the Supreme sounds so good and why this is what we're, that's why the, this music feels so in a way eternal because those feelings are so deep in all of us even now like i want boys to think i'm cute and i want to be cool like i'm older <laughs> yeah. now and that's still very you know it's not it's gone away a, so <laughs> it's it's funny isn't it and there are these kind of i think maybe like there's a kind of primal thing you're right because there is a bit of the mate thing going on finding them i you know that's a big part of it right because at, at least at the beginning it is it's it's not yeah. enough to stop but I, you know and that's the that's the the, the 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 mate finding the mate finding the girlfriend but it's a primal thing right it's a, or finding right. the boyfriend it's a primal primal thing and i think also what we're also doing is we're putting out there it's like you're finding your tribe your right yes. you know your 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 people so it's an attraction that goes on and you know yeah it was a massive thing it was a massive thing i remember classically <laughs> like before and after so my first love yes and I was mad about her. She was very lukewarm about me. But then I, <laughs> yeah, and then I formed the band, got the band together. Holy moly, different story. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing how, now, it might not have been that, it, it, it might not have been that she was in that, totally enamored by that. But what it also did for me was it's, and it's that thing, it suddenly gives you an identity. And for me, you know, growing up in, growing up anyway at that time and in Britain was, there was a real disconnect by what, what people saw and what you felt because there was so mm. much bullshit. And as a, you know, as teenagers, we are, I mean, I think kids anyway, but kids are so sensitive to that, that they're the biggest bullshit detectors and teenagers. I think the difficult teenager is the teenager who senses that and goes, I'm not fucking having this. What the fuck is going on? So <laughs> growing yes. up in Britain, it was very, very, you know, childhood and adolescence was very confusing because the way we were educated and it was so much of it was absolute crap, really. Yeah. There was very little truth. There was very little integrity and authenticity. Um, it was playing parts, playing these roles, you know, yeah, you know, anyway, so of being Somebody, a good kid, of being, being like, a, just say, yeah, what was the role you felt you had been cast in? Well, I was the older child in a in a split right. marriage. So my whole thing was this bizarre thing where I felt I was responsible. I was the, I felt like I was the adult in the room. I felt like my yeah. parents were not adults, <laughs> yeah. you know, and so that's, I had to be, I felt like I had to be the adult, rightly or wrongly, you know, but that was just what happened. But then yeah. it's that whole thing, you go to a private school uh, like we did, and there were many, I don't want to slag it off because there are many, there are some amazing teachers there, some really, yeah. really, a couple of really amazing teachers, the music teacher, Terry James, the English teacher, Nigel Brown, who I did a lot of acting with because acting was another thing that I loved. And right. so they were really great, but it, there was so much bullshit about, you know, 
kids wearing uniforms with ties and it was this playing adults right <laughs> i mean you know it's yeah. like it's like that bullshit ivy league nonsense and yes. these kids who were like well you know uh, you know the idea of and i was <laughs> i was a prefect but the whole notion of i was happy about being a prefect because i meant i could go off and off the school grounds and have a cigarette smoke right but it was this it was this hierarchical bullshit that goes on and it's you know we've it's got better but it still exists and Basically, it was an attitude in Britain that hadn't changed from the Industrial Revolution, which was we are, we are educating our, our sons and daughters to man an empire. And the mm. empire by 1984 had disappeared. But Britain right. was with Margaret Thatcher was playing this role. We were, that's what the Falklands War was about. Mm. I mean, it was fucking ridiculous about this patch, these little islands off the coast of Argentina, you know, and it was all a show of, it was the kind of flexing of an old, you know, Im imperial muscle. It was bullshit. So we were surrounded by this bullshit. And the brilliant thing about a band was, it was suddenly like, it was the first time in my life, and I remember it, and I've said this before, you know, I, I remember first rehearsal with Tom um, and walking to the music school and suddenly everything went into focus. Right. And I suddenly was like, this is it. And my intuition was screaming. It was like, this is, this is the most important thing you, you're ex you've experienced so far. Mm -hmm. So that for me, I've been very lucky because I was able to sort of play this dual role where follow my intuition, but also pacify the parents, the school by seemingly doing the right thing. But deep down, I'm like, this is it, you know, and I'm, <laughs> My way was my way was trying to make people laugh or you know pacify the. I got away with murder at school because I I guess I knew how to make people laugh and, and turn on the charm even to the teachers. I like you know, mm -hmm. but I found this thing and that was the most important thing. So even then, you were in a way. I mean, you. This is such an interesting and in a way unusual story. I think because you're. From the beginning of Radiohead, or what would become Radiohead even, and from the beginning of your sort of relationship with the guitar and with the power of this, like, this space that gets you out of the role game that we just are describing, and is but is available within that sort of ruled and ordered world. So you can have both. You can like keep the peace with the people, with the family that you love and need to be okay with, and also have this, this sort of secret, this like mm. alive place to go to. But all of that's happening in a way where you're still kind of playing a double role. Like mostly what I think about when I think about asking this question of artists is there's usually a moment where it's like, well, and then I wrote my first song and I realized that I had this like lane all to myself where I had to go and be in this private world. But that's not exactly what you're saying. You're saying like the band became this, this space, but like your personal creativity and your, the moments where you would stare down the blank page, so to speak, in a way hadn't fully begun yet. Like that no, started not, maybe eight years ago. Is that, am I understand? Am I putting words totally. into your mouth? Or does that feel uh, right? Absolutely okay. right. And and that's what's kind of so weird about my journey. And I feel so sort of blessed in a way. I've had this other experience of being in a band. Right. So, right. you know, I the band, as far as I was concerned, was always serving the songs the, 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 the sketches and the songs that Tom might come up with. Right. And so my job and our job as a band is to flesh it out, is to, you know, is to take it into rehearsal. I mean, we always wrote our own parts, but, and to bring stuff in and sounds to make it, to make it bigger and, or not bigger or make it, I don't know. I think there's something about like when bands work really well, if it, if, if all five people in the band love it, it's gone through this filter. And everybody yes. needs filters, right? And I think that's one of the, a, a, a band in focus yes. is an incredible, uh, is an incredible uh, uh, organism. Conversely, a band that's dysfunctional, as all bands do get at times, is the worst as anyone mm -hmm. in that situation. So that's where working on your own becomes a lot easier. So yeah, my experience, so, you know, and I would write stuff within the context of, Radiohead in terms of to myself, but I never had, I didn't understand the process. I mean, this is part of the, like, why didn't I ever say to Tom, you know, 
what's your process? There was, and I think, <laughs> right. because there is a process and it starts with something. And it, and I knew that, that a song, you might hear something that it, he, he had the things, he had his initial ideas, the middle ideas and the end ideas. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And, but I always thought that like when, when he wrote, you know, Street Spirit, it came out in one go like and so and and that stuff doesn't i mean there will obviously be examples that i can't give but he would give that they did but but on the whole it doesn't happen like that it's chipping mm -hmm. away at it you get like we were saying so i didn't mm -hmm. know how to write songs right and i'd so kill them i'd kill them dead i'd kill them dead like initially that shit your shit mm. this is crap mm -hmm. and i read that you know that book um it really helped called The Artist's Way. Yeah. Do you know that one? Yeah. And when I was thinking about you were saying, something you were saying earlier was reminding me of, of you're doing a kind of musical morning pages. Just let it yeah. come out and see what, you know, and don't, you're not allowed to ask questions about it, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're tapping into, and that, that for me was really important, reading that was just like, okay, I'll try that. And then it was like, oh, okay, that's it. Uh-huh. And when did you even start trying that excavation? Because I think, and you know, what's so cool about what you've done is that that you've bothered to try. I mean, I don't need to like go on and on. Everyone knows what Radiohead has meant to the to the community of humans who care about music who are alive on the planet at this particular time. I mean, you guys, this collective work has been incredibly important. Um, not in the not just in the sort of hierarchical like triptych of bands, but emotionally it for so many so many people and for the culture and for just humans. Um, and it's like you could so easily have just said, "Well, that was my part," you know, like that. But something pulled you towards mm. towards digging at this other part or pulling on this other thread or whatever metaphor you want to use for what that's like. When did that start? Was it, is it a nagging thing? Did you feel like you needed to serve that? That's, I mean, obviously the, the adjective that I've heard you use to describe the, the work of sort of serving these songs in Radiohead is satisfying. Like it's a right. satisfying process to do that. But some, but obviously there was a piece of you that wasn't satisfied that needs oh, yeah. this other outlet. So when do you, how long have you been struggling with that part? <laughs> like well, how far it's, back it's, does that go? I think quite a while, but I think the thing is, I probably think, I probably think around since OK Computer, I've had this itch. Oh, wow. Um, and I really, um, yeah, it's it's been kind of like this is great. Radiohead's great, and it is it's incredibly, you know, it's incredibly rewarding. It has been incredibly rewarding because, you know, it's an amazing place to be uh, to to experiment. You know, there's it's 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 great for that. However, there was always like for me, there was always like this isn't enough. This is not this. Mm -hmm. the, uh, why am I not? You know, why am I not, cr I don't feel fulfilled on this, but it's mm. funny how things, things can not conspire, but things. So around the time of OK Computer, I went into heavy depression, which w lasted really until it was about three years. It was during Kid A, mm. the recording of Kid A and everything. And um, so I, that form of depression is not creative for me. It's not like, you know, I hear people, I've, you know, they talk about the creativity of manic depression. Depression for me manifests itself in, I feel exhausted. I, mm -hmm. it's hard enough to get my six foot five frame out of the bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I just want to, the depression for me is that I don't want to get up. I want to lie in bed, you know? Yeah, I do. Um, so there's no creative. Had you been, no, Sorry, had you yeah. felt that before? Was it a familiar no. place? So, so that must have been very scary to be yeah, smacked but, upside the head in a moment of great success. <laughs> it, well, it was this. <laughs> They're weird, probably related. Yeah, it was. It was this weird thing because, of course, you've reached the kind of this incredible place. And and yeah. here's the thing: like it's it's like you hear this a lot, but you know, I had all the things that I thought. I mean, there'd always been an issue, right? There'd always been there'd always been this low flying, low hung sort of melancholy depression stroke that that a bit like a, a british 
day in in February that sits the cloud sits at like 50 meters. It had always been there. And I that's why music was such a powerful thing because music and and particularly Radiohead and making music was a place where the clouds would disappear. And for those brief moments, I could pop my head above the clouds and it would fill me with this incredible feeling. You know, I always remember when we rehearsed OK Computer, like coming away from those rehearsals, feeling like alive in a way that I'd never felt before. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that kind of, it, it was a new feeling to be, to be sort of floored by it. I'd never been floored by it. Um, but, you know, I got through that and, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, was the birth of, you know, birth of our first child, Sal. Yeah. And, and so I remember when, so another big thing, another big thing wow. with me had been like, I don't want to fuck this family up. That's, yeah. that for me, again, is kind of more important than the music. Because having come from a split family, I was like, I remember the night my parents told me, and I was age 10 and I was obviously devastated. But I remember like planting almost like a flag in the ground going, I'm not going to fucking do this. Mm -hmm. I am not, I'm going to fucking make this, I'm going to have the best fucking family, which actually in hindsight is not necessarily the best kind of emotion to have because then you put so much pressure on, you know all that book right all that stuff. <laughs> you're, you're just like right i will have the best family you know like through grit to tea so it's it's that so however so when sal was born it mm. was suddenly like oh my god i had the biology kicked in as well and it was like this is the most important thing and then una was born two years later so what i was doing was any time that i wasn't with radiohead which was a lot of the time I was just completely full on with the kids and helping mm. Susan and being, you know, and having these amazing kind of magical experiences together, holidays, lots of just the four of us being in the car, driving down to France, all these really, ma mm. that really, so I didn't have the time. I did not have <laughs> to the be time. depressed <laughs> to be, de yes. to be depressed and, and to, and to create. Cause you know, I see. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, there was that. And also the, you know, the, 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 I, I'd come out that depression and I'd stop things like I'd, so my depression was also aided and abetted by alcohol, drugs, smoking, mm -hmm. uh, nicotine. And I gave up all of those pretty much overnight before the kids were born. Wow. And that was a massive thing. I have to tell you guys about an amazing new service I've found called FrameBridge. FrameBridge makes it easier and more affordable than ever to frame your favorite things without ever leaving the house. Very important in this day and age. Add a gallery wall to your home office or send the perfect gift. From art prints and diplomas to the photos sitting right on your phone, you can FrameBridge just about anything. Here is how it works. You just go to FrameBridge.com and upload your photo, or they will send you packaging to safely mail in your physical pieces. You preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts so you can see what it'll look like. Then you choose your favorite or get free recommendations from their talented designers, which I have actually done, and they're good at their jobs. The experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your item and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a framing store, their prices start at just $39, and all the shipping is free, which is a huge deal. Plus, my listeners will get 15% off their first order at framebridge.com when they use my code DIFFICULTARTIST. This is the editorializing section of this ad read where I'm supposed to tell you about my own personal experience, and I actually like believe in this product so much. I have, I don't know, five or 10 different FrameBridge items in my office. I'm a collector of you know, old ticket stubs and like weird posters I buy on eBay when I'm supposed to be writing. And they're not, they all go in a framebridge frame because otherwise I would be like bankrupt from having these things professionally framed. So I really love framebridge. Get started today, frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift. Go to framebridge.com and use promo code difficult artist to save an additional 15% off your first order, which is amazing. Just go to framebridge.com, promo code difficult artist, framebridge.com, promo code difficult artist. So is that what snapped you out of it then? The sort of like, because there are these, these jolts that, that can kind of like almost like a cold 
ice plunge or something. And it's like, yeah. I guess I can't. So is that what happened? You, you did these, you did these things in terms of also like n- changing the alchemy of what you were putting into your body, which is huge. But those were those changes in anticipation of being a father. Would you, ha- or was it kind of a, they were, it's just all happening at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I'm going to give you the. I'm going to give you. I've never told this story before, really, but I'm going to give Uh-oh. you the truth. I'm going to give you the okay. truth because um, it's kind of interesting and it's a bit woo woo, um, but it's all part. It's a massive part. Um, we had two friends who came back from Brazil in 2001, and one of them was very, very ill. Was sort of on mm. death's door, and he told us that he'd been to see this healer in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, Susan and I were immediately like, we have to do this. It wasn't like a mental thing. So Mm -hmm. we booked our plane tickets to Brazil, which started another love affair with this incredible country, which I'd had before, but I'd never visited. But and part of the journey was going to see this healer in Brazil. And it was an extraordinary experience. It was Mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, I don't think it's kind of the experience. I don't, it doesn't feel right to you know, it's a very private thing. Yeah, but, right. But what, 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 what I will say is that I suddenly woke up and it was, it was like, I mean, science couldn't explain. I come from, a, you know, my family are all medics, basically. I come right. from everything has got to be quantifiable, measured, blah, blah, blah. I still haven't been able to tell my father about this because they would dismiss it as woo. They go, oh, fucking new age bollocks. But here's <laughs> yeah. the thing. You can dismiss it, but if you've experienced what I experienced, it was, I had this experience and I was, I I remember because it was like, I had this sort of operation I was operated on, but nobody touched my body. And three days I was in bed and I lay there and I remember what, and I could feel this thing happening within me. And I was like, oh my God, magic actually exists. (laughs) That. Wow. And and wow. I, I yeah, it was it was bonkers. And I know it, this a lot of people might be going, oh, you know, but this is my truth. I'm not making this stuff up. This happened. And and it was funny because when I got back to Britain, I wanted to share this with everybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> of course, I'm like, fucking hell, look what I've experienced. <laughs> Everybody's, I mean, almost 90% of them thought I'd run away to some cult. <laughs> and they and they and they were like, Oh, you you just following this kind of typical hippie music <laughs> right. kind of path. And I'm like, going, okay, I need to put a lid on this, but I feel comfortable <laughs> about this now because this is the right what time. What year to- was that? Cause that's also things have got the 2002. woo-woo has gotten. Right. So it was earlier. I mean, I'm picturing early woo-woo. You- Early woo woo, you were you know like the Russell Brand character and get him to the Greek. This is like a parody of rock star behavior. You know, I can see, yeah. I can imagine you come back and you're like, guys, magic is real, and yeah. everyone's like, please <laughs> shut up, Ed. <laughs> and I didn't have the strength of character to go. Also, when the door was shut, slammed in my face, I didn't have the. I was like, oh fuck, this is. I didn't. I, I wasn't like, fuck you. It does exist. It was like, I retreated. I didn't have that strength yeah. to go like so. Anyway, so but also that, who cares? Like you don't cares? need to evangelize. No. It's your personal experience, and you yeah. it snapped you out of this. Yeah, totally darkness. I rem- so I remember mm-hmm. the next day looking at the sky in Brazil, looking at these big skies. Or mm. once I got out of bed three days later, and suddenly feeling like it felt like there was a veil in front of me all my life, mm. and suddenly that veil had been mm. sort of pulled apart, and I could really experience things. I could really mm. feel and suddenly I was alive with being alive. You know, I was Mm -hmm. suddenly, so, and of course it doesn't last, that feeling doesn't last, but it was enough to jolt me out of it and to go like, okay. And it was brilliant because again, I remember thinking, okay, this is the first day of the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And it started me on this path, this path of healing, being a father, but also being Creatively. creatively. And yeah. So, but yeah, so that's, that was the jolt, if you like, that was the moment, so, the eureka moment. And is that a moment where you, but it's not like you come out of that going, well, I will write songs now. It's more <laughs> this clear, if I'm understand, it's more this yeah. sort of, it, to, to use the veil metaphor, it's like, I'm now in the world. Like I'm no longer at, at sort of arm's length from it or somehow removed from it. Like I'm here in this life. And 
I mean, again, with the woo-woo, but it's a bit of a rebirth, right? Like that's yeah. kind of, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, how does that, did it start then? Did the, did the, is that the itch in, in a sense, the beginning of the itch? And it's, it, if so, well, yeah, is it? I mean, is that you, when you think it kind of started? Do you know what it is? I think, I think it's the start. I think what it does is it's like, it's the start of truth, mm-hmm. knowing your truth and I know that can sound grand, but it's a sense, what do you really feel? Yes. Because again, the way we've been brought up in Britain was, it was not about how you felt. There was so much disconnect with how you felt. How did you really feel? Because you were supposed to be a certain way or supposed to, you know, even, even the, you know, as a 16 year old boy, you know, 16 year old boys are supposed to be sort of like, yeah, I never felt like kind of quite, macho and kind of I never was like that yeah. that that was I didn't feel comfortable with that there was yeah. a, a, a feminine side to me that was very important but I wasn't allowed to like express that so you know I tried to be cool um hmm. so it's a process and it continues it's about layers it's layers of truth and it's again it's I'm a big I'm a big subscriber to the to the doctrine of reincarnation, this idea that we've had many lives. And for me, it's about like, what is my purpose here? Mm -hmm. And the more I've kind of chipped away at it, and and, and it is like a layer thing, it's the more more clarity I get, and the more I sense of like how creativity is a central part of it. And, you know, it took me by surprise. It's taken, all of this has taken me by surprise, because as you said, there is no need for me to, you know, nobody. And in fact, this also used to hold me back. Nobody needs to hear a, a, a solo record from another member of Radiohead. I mean, there are a lot of solo and they're all great. But, yeah. you know, my and my my attitude has always been in the past is like, you know, in fact, I've, I, if, if, if everybody's making solo records, I will deliberately not make a solo record to be right. to, to be like obtuse, you know, um, so. Right. To be the original. Yeah. Well, to be, to be to the be one the original, who stands but, out. Right. I guess. But yeah. not to go because then people will, you know, cause people go like, Oh, when are you going to do your solo record? I'm like, I'm right. not fucking doing a solo record. I don't need to. I'm like, and, and to be honest, I'm create, you know, I was creatively fulfilled. I was busy. I was very, very creatively fulfilled by Radiohead. And, and, you know, it's not just the music side. A band is, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. It's like, it is like an organism and it's, you know, there was, there was all sorts of stuff going on as well. Um, so it, th- th- what's interesting is the more I've, the more I've really asked myself, well, how do I really feel? And that actually really, that started back then, but it took on a greater weight when I was making this record, this last record, yeah. I made. because mm-hmm. you have to ask that about, there was a point in the records we've been working on it for about six months and I went away, we did a Radiohead tour and I came back and listened to it and I was like, oh my God, this is fucking awful. This oh, is, no. and oh. that was that, that was that moment of like, oh no. And that was how I really felt. I've been in sort of, not denial, but I guess I, yeah, I, I had been in, in denial. And so that thing of suddenly really, really embracing it, something like truth is, truth is the most important thing here. And it's like a, it's like a knife and it's, 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 it can be quite unkind as well. It can be quite brutal. And yes. I, I uh, uh, but I'm trying to do it gently because, you know, <laughs> because, you know, if you're too brutal, you can, you can cause some injuries on the way. Right. Absolutely. So yes. You just have to recognize that it's not right and chip and work out why it's And, and, and I think that whole thing about what's your truth is, is at the heart of creativity. I really, mm-hmm. th- I mean, I don't know if you, but it's like, do, how do yeah. you, how do you really feel about that? Have you got something to say? Have you really, you know? Right, but that your answer to that, I mean, I definitely relate to that. I think I think often of the creative process is entirely about, um, well, everything you've been trying to get, trying to stop thinking enough that I can just feel. But, but I also got into music in the first place for that. Like, just as a fan, yeah. aside from writing, just the way it feels to see a band, the first thing that I got out of live music, especially, 
or, or even over like listening to something in my bedroom or whatever was just that when I saw the Ayaz play, for example, I was not able to think anymore. I just yeah. had to be in that room and be present before I even knew like annoying phrases like be present, you know, it's just like, yeah. I'm just, this is just happening at my body in a way that's putting me in a state of like bliss. And na- now I get that from nature and other places too. And certainly from live music, but it's the most direct route that I've ever yeah. over drugs, over anything else. It's like, just put me in a room with people making these sounds and I will be able to like exhale and just get, with life, you know, just to be in in that flow state that you're describing. But I think, so yes, this is all to say I, I more than relate. And certainly on a creative level, that's something that I try and do in my own work. But I think what's so, what's interesting, what I'm continuing to sort of pick at, I guess, about your process is that you've, and this, I know this too, because of reading your interviews around this, which maybe is cheating a little bit, but it's like this whole notion of finding truth and of pursuing feeling and Mm. emotion. There's other words I wrote down, directness, emotion, the feminine, keeping things simple. There's something I read where you were saying, I'm, irony is not interesting. Like, I don't want any part of any of that. Like it, it does feel like there's a kind of dharma for you to just kick against all these <laughs> these english notions of what art should look like and the i mean irony and, com- and not complexity but sort of like sophistication feeling and emotion are not the first words that come to mind when people talk about sort of the realm of like the british aesthetic which is of course a generalization i don't mean no. there aren't lots of british artists with a lot of feeling but yeah, and I, I, I guess I just, without having a very interesting way of phrasing this, like, can you talk about that piece a little bit, about your kind of, your quest to speak up for emotion in music and how that connects to whatever it is that made you say, yeah, okay, actually, I am going to need to go ahead and do a solo record. And like, I don't care what people are going to say or how that, yeah. all the sort of bullshit around everything you were just saying about, I don't want to be that guy from Radiohead making a solo, like... Yeah. You needed to do it, and this is part of why. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I, the feeling I wanna, piece. I just want to pick you up a bit. It's interesting what you said about the irony thing, because Please. I think to be ironic, it is a, it's a very British trait, isn't it? And, and you know, Irish as well. Um, you know, oh, yeah. Uh, Oscar Wilde. And um, I think you have to, to, to be a really good, to be really good at irony, you have to be almost like Morrissey was back in the Smiths. You have to have such a sort of wicked word play that I just don't have, first and foremost. However, so, you know, there's nothing worse than than lukewarm irony. You know, people <laughs> trying to be ironic and they just don't have the wit for it. I don't have the wit for irony, you know? You need, to, but here's the other thing. Irony is also hiding. Irony is not saying this is how I really feel. Right. And, you know, that's the heart. You know, you know what the Brits are like. We're all, I just keep saying, we're zipped up. We're kind of uptight. And that was the amazing thing going to Brazil was right. actually Brazil taught me it shed a load of skins. And it was just like, hang on a sec. I'm, I was <laughs> never comfortable with being zipped up. I was always the guy who emotionally would put his foot in it and say the thing. And people would either slag me off or they jump right in. They go, yeah, that's how I feel. I was right. always that thing. And so that's me. That's my truth. So mm-hmm. that's, I love that. I love that. And I love what's happening in the world at the moment with, I love the fact that the, the, you know, of all the negativity, the plus points are people are saying how they've really feel. They're saying they're vulnerable. I yes. always wanted to say, I'm fucking vulnerable. I don't feel comfortable here, but I didn't want to. But after a while, and, and, and a lot of irony is about being uncomfortable, not giving your truth. Is, is, it's like a veil. It's a, it's a clever veil. And it's yes. brilliant and plays a wonderful part in literature. I'm kind of dumb. I'm not done with it, but it's not for me. I can't right. do it. And for me, it's all about, I'm trying to get to that point of that feeling. And again, trying to, bottle that feeling and it's uh, of of uh, of maybe transcendence of mm-hmm. beauty that kind of that you talked about in in i think one of the things about live gigs when they're really so powerful is that people are just being and, and as a band i remember 
the the most the best you know it's a the first time going on stage or the you know maybe not the first time but after you've done it about 10 time times what you loved about it it's like an exorcism it's just like i don't exactly. have to be this fucking mil there's a truth here i can just like fucking be i can yes. fucking i can i can shout really loudly on stage and be drowned out by the instant and i need to do that and there are moments yes. in the you know there are moments in a radiohead set when i would just fucking roar i'd be like yeah. ah you know yeah and yeah. it was a it's a very powerful thing so you know i guess it's that's who i am and so i'm trying to that's that's what I'm trying to access that. I'm trying to access yes. that point yes. and communicate that and and get to a point where people that's what I'm trying to do. I'm kind of that that place. That's the place. And it's a place of it can be a place of sadness, it can be a place of elation, it can be a place of of anger, frustration, mm -hmm. but it's to me it's all about you know, it's it's, I want my music to move me, and and it comes down to my personal taste. The music that moved me was has always been, uh, it's always been about the whole thing. It's it's ne I, I'm, I I've never really sort of it's never been enough that it's a great lyricist. You know right. why the why the Smiths was so powerful for me exactly was because you had this amazing lyricist in Morrissey, but that that wasn't what I really pulled me in. It was the melodies. It was the songs. It was it was Johnny Marr's guitar playing and Andy Rourke's bass playing and these melodies that were the juxtaposition, as you know, to those quite caustic and witty, witty and and, and emotional lyrics at times. But yes, it was. It's all about. It's all about a feeling. It's all about trying to get to that. And I think that's the amazing thing about music, is that it's able to. You can do that, you can record it, and you can capture that feeling as all our favorite records have that. Just because it's summer doesn't mean your child should stop learning. Laurel Spring School meets the highest standards of online education and is the perfect place for students who are looking to gain a deeper understanding of their studies as they prepare for college. Offering a broad catalog of quality courses for students in grades 6 through 12, Laurel Springs encourages students to go beyond the curriculum and pursue their individual passions and talents. Through their Accelerated Learning Summer Program, students can complete a full-year course in just 12 weeks. Laurel Springs takes a self-paced approach to online classes, allowing students to complete their work wherever and whenever they'd like. And their mastery-based instructional model lets students continue to revisit the material until they feel comfortable and are ready to move on. By enrolling with Laurel Springs, students can get ahead and improve their academic skills. Visit laurelsprings.com for more information and to register today. So, I digress a little bit. So the question. No, then, not at all. This is exactly yes. Go ahead. Um, so then you say, why? How? Why do I? Why do I feel the? How do I feel the impulse to do that? Because that's my truth. I have to do it. And in a way, it would be a lot simpler if I didn't. Right. Well, that's life what would, I mean. Is yeah. Life would be a lot simpler, and I wouldn't have to have singing lessons, and I wouldn't have to worry about <laughs> my voice, and I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to worry about and i you know i wouldn't have to worry about whether i get a record deal or whether people will like it it's just something you do and and it's been interesting because where i am now is i've got to the stage and then what happened for me in the pandemic was that i yeah. went back to this dark place yes and it was really it felt you know like a lot of us and it was like a dark night of the soul collectively and it was for me individually as a uh, personally but what it the lesson and i'm a real believer in that you know places of of darkness of of being actually really important places that you don't what i'd always done is kind of medicated myself out that way through drugs yeah. or whatever but it's like mm -hmm. no what's what's the message here there's something here mm -hmm. what is really going on and again that's it's about the truth what do you really feel and what I realized was I had to let, I'm having to let go and I'm learning to let go of all those things. You know, basically my, the, 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 that, that kind of British emotional framework yes. that was formed as a child, I'm having to let yes. go of that. 
And uh-huh. all that stuff about how you measure yourself, achievement, all that stuff. And it's a letting go so that the music and I can just, you know, again, this sounds a bit woo, but just flow more. I realized that it's exhausting when you've got that little voice that's going, you know, you're heaven or hell for that day. If you're in the studio or where you're writing, it's like, do I like that? Is that good? Right. Uh, I just got, you know, it's just, it's shut debilitating, up. right? Shut, yeah. <laughs> shut up. Let it flow. Don't worry yeah. about it. And it, I had this great conversation with Jim Jarmusch mm. earlier in the year. And it was, he, again, he put it so beautifully. He said, we're just a complete work in progress. And he said, every mm. film that I make, I just, it, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, <laughs> wow. And I'm learning each time. And oh, uh, yeah. And it was just. And okay, to hear that from someone who makes work that you love is so yeah. reassuring for all the reasons we're talking about. Like it's. Yeah. But so why why did that? Is it a shedding of of that framework, as you put it, that's that caused the depression? Is it the stillness? I mean, you've been doing you know these in isolation sessions, which are beautiful and cool, and there's so much on your social media, which in this case is a really good thing you know, I don't often say thank goodness for social media, but in this limited (laughs) case, like there's a, there is this sense of sort of getting to see people's mutual struggles with all of this isolation. And you've, you've really done that, created a portal to that for people who are interested in your work. Why did it make you so sad? Would you know? And you don't have to know. Um, No, no. I I think what happens is, and it's interesting. Thank you for saying about, about the social media stuff, because what I've wanted to do, I always think it's important that people share their experiences because our tendency is to kind of like retreat into our own and we we experience these things alone or maybe with one other person but I think there's so much the reason I say all this stuff I don't have to say any of this stuff but the reason I I try and be really emotionally honest is because every human being goes you know there's this is a unit it's like the it's like the six even Morrissey you know even Morrissey (laughs) exactly even Morrissey so my thing was, I think what happens is, and I, you know, I think what happened with a lot of us in the pandemic is the way we live our lives and the way my life was set up to be lived and the way I was educated is, is you get on that hamster wheel. Now, yeah. my hamster wheel, age 27, became a gold plated hamster wheel. I'm like, I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. But I don't stop. And you don't stop. Right. And you suddenly like, and more, more, more. When is it? When is it enough? You know, when is it enough? And so the way that I've been programmed and conditioned, like a lot of us, is like, it's never enough. And that's what our fucking whole capitalist system is based on, isn't it? It's never enough. Buy that, do that. And Mm -hmm. it's, there's, it's, is this, I don't want to get into this, whether this is a deliberate thing or whether this is a happy accident thing. Are we deliberately educated and placed in this thing? But you know, I'm 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 very open it to be deliberate. I'm not like a conspiracy theory. Anyway, let's not go yes, down that rabbit all. hole. That's a whole. <laughs> that's, that's round your, two of this podcast. That's, when we that's for your yeah difficult. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm I'm so what happens is the pandemic suddenly. You know, my album comes out. I'm supposed oh, to be no. touring. That stops, and I still like the first lockdown. i have still like doing lots of interviews. Ding, 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 ding. The second lockdown happens and bang, everything stops. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and I'm really thankful for it in a way because suddenly that, that, that gold plated hamster wheel has stopped Mm -hmm. spinning. It's, it's jarred. It, it can't move. (laughs) And so all the ghosts, you know, the ghosts Mm -hmm. come back and the ghosts came back Mm -hmm. and it was just like, Oh my God. And I felt like this feeling that I felt, this darkness that I hadn't felt for 20 years, like I told you about that previous depression. Mm-hmm. And it, and I, the, the, the initial thing I was like, oh my God, I thought I, I mean, I've been working on this. I thought I've, fucking hell, I've processed right, this shit, haven't I? Ra- <laughs> I'm like, oh, do we have to go here again? <laughs> <laughs> but obviously we did. And, and that Surprise. was part, that was part yeah. of it. And, and, and the stillness made me, it's like, a, it's, I love, you know, the onions, the onion, skin you know another layer of the metaphor. onion metaphor mm-hmm. and it's just like okay this is on a deeper level and i realize my mind is just like whirring away whirring whirring away which is a product of you know and i it, it's so 
the, 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 what I realized I needed to do is to get out of my mind. And again, I love that phrase, get, you know, we always use, I'm getting out of my mind, but that's what I need to do. And into right. and kind of into the senses and to really totally. hear, to hear the birds, you know, to see the leaf, the leaves on that tree and really not just kind of like, oh yeah, that's the past. And, and right now, what am I going to write? And, and what I'd realized was, so I did, I'd been writing quite a bit. I've been writing, stuff mm. had been coming out, but I wasn't connecting to it. Mm. So I had 30 odd things that were kind of cool, but I hadn't connected to it. And I realized that I needed to, it's a bit like the writer's block thing. Something had to shift, something has to shift in me in mm. order for, the right music or the right thing to come along. That's, I may be wrong. It might be that I've just dried up and that's it forever. But who knows? It might be, we might be having this conversation and this is the last creative thing I talk about. But I, I, <laughs> I don't- I seriously in, doubt it. But yeah. I don't intrinsically feel that, but I feel like in order for me to get to this next stage of music, uh, I've had to shift. And actually what's interesting, I mean, I can talk to you now and I, I'm, I'm not, like, I couldn't have done this two months ago. I'd have uh -huh. kind of, I'd have been like, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I've got perspective. Yeah, I'm not ready for this. I'm not, but it's an, inter for me, this is a, a really fascinating time because I'm letting go of a lot of, lot of stuff and, and particularly, you know, the, the way that this whole middle-class achieving kind of how, you know, it's like, you know, you know that we all, we, it's like, sure do. Yeah, I got two all, professor, you know, academic parents. I know all about achieving and having, yes. Um, yeah, and that's how we define ourselves. And that's how I define myself. And, you know, and the, and the, unfortunately, the thing about that is, you know, you would have thought that, you know, I'm, I'm, as I kept saying, I always say, I want the golden ticket in life. Yeah. There is no reason why I should be getting depressed or, or, you know, dissatisfied with or, or whatever, or, or, or feeling that I should have more, I need more or, or need more. And, and, and it is that moment when you go like, hang on a second. And I say this, if I can't be happy, then God, what must it be like for other, you know, right. other right. people who've really got horrendous. So, you know, I don't want to sound like the sort of the meanderings of a, of a, <laughs> of a spoiled man. And I'm really aware that I know, I mean, I know how lucky, I mean, I know I'm such a lucky person, but, Again, it's about, and that actually, for instance, that stopped me digging in the truth, you know, because, right. because that stops you allowing it, validating your feelings. You kind of go, no, oh, no, I'm not allowed to feel like that. I'm a lucky bugger, put a lid on it. But actually- What right do I have? Yes. What right totally. do I have? But I think, you know, the truth, and I think, and I, there's no self-pity. I don't feel sorry for myself in the slightest. I'm actually incredibly thankful for these challenging opportunities because for me, you know, how challenging is it really? Other people say like, well, you don't have to worry about money. And that's absolutely, that's the, probably the biggest challenge. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely self-indulgent on this, but I've got to allow myself to be self-indulgent to get through to the next part and, and hopefully create. You're like the only rock star I know who never really got whose fame did not come with actual rock stardom, <laughs> like the <laughs> ego of rock, you know, like you haven't been that self-indulgent. Like you always talk about how your role in Radiohead was sort of the mom and Tom is, is, is the, the, the daddy dad figure, but you have to sort of take care of and this sort of yeah. nurturing and the feminine side and all these things that you've talked many times really beautifully about, but there is a centrality, an ego in I think mostly a good sense when it's in balance to the creative act, to yeah. the act of like you, you are supposed to be self-indulgent in the sense of making space for that channel to be open and to yeah. protect it. Like my friend Dave Siddick says that the job is of creative life is, or I think he's talking about being a producer, but is to protect the sandbox from the adults. And that yeah. includes yourself as an adult coming in being like, this isn't good enough, or this isn't like, it's about preserving fiercely, defending fiercely the right to get in and, and play and mm. only put in there what you bring and not be thinking about anybody else's needs and all that stuff. So I, it's funny. So what I was going to ask is 
two things really. Do you feel like with having sort of broken the seal and made this album, is there a relief like that an itch has been scratched on some level? Like, is there an exhalation? So I get, yeah, that's, that's my first question. Is, is there a sense of like, okay, well I did that. Like I did that thing and it's beautiful. I mean, the album is beautiful. I, I have, you know how I feel about the record. I've, I've written to you about it and, wow, and spoken you. to you about it, but oh yeah, it's uh yeah, it's a, uh, it puts you in the place, you know? Um, it takes you to the place. Um, but do you feel a sense of relief for having done that part? Because now what I'm hearing you talk about is what you're going to do next and how to sort of like clear, peel back yet another layer to get to the next piece. But like, have you given yourself a minute to say, okay, well it took eight fucking years and I finally made this thing. And I, I, cause I could imagine that might've been hard to do given that you know, we don't have to go off on all this if you don't want to, but like that you were supposed to tour this album yeah. in a way that you didn't get the chance to do. And that sucks, you know, and maybe have has curtailed a bit the sense of completion of that cycle that you were working towards for so long. Um, it's in, yeah. It's in, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I think what what will be great on what what is great? I mean, I, I don't know if it, I was going to say what's great about getting through your first record, but there was a lot of energy that I used up going, can I do this? Am I mm -hmm. able to do this? And there was a lot of self doubt. And at times that just, you know, that just, that just took up a lot of space and that's not, that's just gets in the way. So there's a kind of relief to have done it. There's a really, there's a relief to have done it. Um, I think there's, you know, one always, I think, what happens is that the second time goes around, can I do it again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I do it again? Or am I used to, but I think, you know, that's just, I am going to do it again. Um, Good. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm really going to do it again. And I think it can take, I don't know if you found this, like with your, when you publish or you got stuff published for the first time, but often it actually the process of putting your first thing out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eat, kind of shines a mirror back on what you do and it's suddenly like it's again another form of awakening it's another layer of the truth it's like oh and I remember when the record came out I was suddenly like oh I'm done with this this emotion this <laughs> thing that I, this thing it was really weird it was really weird yeah. it came out and I'm like I suddenly having been sort of like I felt really good about it really buoyant and like I'm really proud of this and then the moment it was released mm -hmm. I suddenly heard all the flaws it was so yeah, weird. It's, I guess that's natural, right? And it is a bit yeah, like totally. when, you, when you play a song, we always said like one of the best things about playing songs before, to an audience before you record them is you can be in your rehearsal room in the five year whatever uh, and go, this sounds good. But the moment you play in front of an audience, it's mm. suddenly like, oh no, this doesn't work. But yeah, you could have been <laughs> rehearsing that song for two months. There's right. something in the process of just putting it out there and you get it yeah. back. And, it's and a, there's a there's a great Joan Didion line which I have I'm probably even said already on this podcast because I'm obsessed with this so much but it just makes me feel better. She and it feeds into what Jim Jarmusch is saying to you, which is so she says it's in a Paris Review interview and she says that right before she starts writing anything, she's so filled with like excitement and joy and sort of like <laughs> just love for this thing that isn't there yet. And then she says, as soon as she writes the first sentence, it's already fucked. Like it's, of course I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> she doesn't, you know, but she's like, I've already ruined it. Yeah. And it's not that it's been ruined. It's like, I ruined it. Like I, yeah. there was this platonic ideal of a thing out there in the whatever, and I put my pen to the paper and now it's ruined. And then she says, and this is art. She says, but I figure if I just go ahead and finish it, even though it's already ruined, I might have the chance after it's done to start again. Yeah. And that is the whole game. Like that's the whole game. And that's like Jim Jarmusch being like, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, each one, who knows what the, the, I think so much about the, the act of creative life is the real work is being willing to suffer in that place to just be like, I don't know. Like yeah. it might be shit every time it might be <laughs> shit. And sometimes it is shit. Uh, yeah. And then you're like, see, I told you. And then it's like, but you might have the chance to start again. And that there isn't, 
this ever, this feeling really outside of those discrete moments you were describing earlier of like, oh my God, it's working. Like sometimes it feels that way, but even the next day you might be like, nah, that was all right. Yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's so brilliant. I hadn't heard that. I mean, and I love Joan Didion and I think it's Yes, I know you do. I think it's so interesting you mention her. One of the things I always loved about her as a as an extraordinary creator and, and, and force in writing was her humility. And that for me is a, a really, really key thing. Like, you know, I did this, did one of my in isolation pieces with Johnny Marr uh, mm-hmm. two days yeah. ago. And he's an example of somebody you're very, I've been very lucky because I've met these people along the way. And he was an example of somebody I met 20 years ago for the first time. He's like num- right. numero uno. He's like biggest mm-hmm. guitar hero for me. And I yeah. meet him and he's not, you know how some people sometimes, you know, act that they listen and they don't listen. <laughs> I sure do. Yes. You sure do. We all do, right? <laughs> he's, a, he's an incredible, him and his wife, Angie, were, I was completely taken aback because they are they were such incredible humble human beings and you know and it was funny because a couple of nights ago with johnny i was i suddenly put i'd never done in 20 years i put my smith's fanboy head on and i then suddenly went hang on a sec you wrote all these songs even electronic and all that stuff you did with other you didn't do anything shit for ever you know if you did everything you you, you worked with billy bragg you did sexuality what an incredible billy bragg's best pop song you know you did all that you know you so i think that 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 humility thing and i've sort of brought that in but mm. for me and it's like it's like it's like all the all all my favorite artists all my favorite people have always had that humility because they understand that there is suffering in it and mm-hmm. and and they don't, and and they sort of embrace that, but they're humble enough to know that that's part of it. And, you know, and and they're also thankful, you know, there but for the grace right. of God. Exactly. They're all so Well, hum- and that, that you're not trying to get out of it hurting. No. Like, <laughs> you know, that it's not, that's not what we're, that's not the conceit of what's happening here. It's, uh, we say over and over, you go to make art because you're trying to exercise something and that's well and good. And it's true. Like, especially when you're talking about the kind of work you and I both care about where it's like, you're using feeling first, you're leading with feeling rather than like, say the Smiths. I was thinking about this earlier when you were speaking about them. I mean, they're kind of a perfect marriage, as you say, but there are other artists that use language as a gateway to emotion and then yeah. there are some artists that use like the the sort of the sensory as as the gateway to, as the path to understanding like it's you're coming at yeah. pa- you're coming at it from two different directions but you're getting to some of the same places but when you're doing that like there's this notion that okay well we're get we're all in this game to like escape our pain and it's not really true you're in it to like to um express it to give it a place like my shrink always says right she's like i i've been hearing this for many years and i still don't know how to do it but i'm trying it's like she always says lizzie you have to feel those feelings first Mm. you got to feel what you're describing first and i'm like i know i know you know every i'm like no 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 i know i wrote that down last time like I wrote down that I should feel my feelings. Like I took that note, you know, it's like, yeah. is that, are we done now or what? And I think that tends to be so much of a part of how people view, even really successful artists view their own creative life. It's like, well, I, it shouldn't look like this. It should no. look like, it should look easy or whatever. And to your point, like that is something that Joan Didion and I mean, certainly Johnny, but these are amazing examples of the humility keeps you in the place where you're, you're not ever out of the woods emotionally. Yeah. That's not even what we're trying for. So that's and very I, inspiring. Yeah, and actually, that's right. You actually, if, if if truth be told, you wouldn't actually want, you know. Right. I, I, I want to keep on feeling these places. You know, right. I now, having gone to that, had a dark night of the soul, I've got, I that's, that's going to be in this next music. It has to be. This yeah. is my experience. And, if I hadn't had that, then I wouldn't be there. So, I mean, of course, it's here's the other thing I think that's really important. And I, 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 I think I've sort of realized this. 
as a as an artist we're very lucky as you are as people who create that we can um we can channel all this stuff into this stuff and some people will like it and other people won't but on the whole it can be we're very lucky because we get to express this thing and often mm -hmm. you can frame i i i'm i'm trying to get away from this but often artists validate what they're going through and they validate it in solely in terms of like well it's valid because i'm gonna get some great work from this do you know what i mean that's <laughs> yes that's that's the byproduct of suffering if you like for want of a better word right that's bullshit to me now yeah. because that's again that puts too much weight on the music and that's that's not fair on the music and and actually your first and foremost job is to be a sentient loving uh respectful human being on this planet and i yes. that for me is the most important thing so that's the bit that i keep chipping away with and if music and creativity is a byproduct of that, great, you know, brilliant, uh, and and that's great. But it's not. I I, I think I think it can be quite dangerous if people frame if artists frame their life as it's all about what they publicly produce. Because it's a kind of capitalism of art in yeah, that way, where you're, totally. you're yeah. <laughs> The Where's the product of, of my pain? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing. And it's that's what I've been trying to get away from. And it is, yeah. I think it's a really, I, I, it's like, and then, then you make art, then you make art or you make something that flows out naturally rather than having mm -hmm. all this weight to it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really, I, 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 that's what I'm trying to do is like the, 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 the journey of, of chipping away at, working at myself and trying to become a better human being i'm not framing it in a way because i'm a musician or there's going to be something that people like because of it no i'm doing it because i that's my responsibility as a soul on this planet and if mm -hmm. anything happens and now what i've got to do is learn that if nothing happens that's okay too <laughs> right and it's okay if that sucks yeah <laughs> like absolutely. if that feels bad that's also okay <laughs> yeah that's also all right and it's like a process and and it, yeah. it is, it's like the, like we're saying, it's just, and again, seeing it as the big thing as an arc and go, okay, because again, we can get so yeah. obsessed with what's in front of our nose right now. Yeah. So, the you micro. Know, micro. Difficult Artist is a presentation of Cadence 13 Studios. It is executive produced by Chris Corcoran and me, Lizzie Goodman. Production and direction is led by Terrence Malangone. Editing and mastering by Bob Tabador. Our original theme song was composed by Nick Doss. For more, including behind the scenes content from guests, follow us on our Instagram and Twitter at Difficult Artist. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and review. Thanks so much for listening.